ask you a question and see if there's anybody else that does this. Be a moment of honesty. Is anybody ready for the honesty police today? Okay, how many of us, this is not the, this is not the question, but how many of us spend way too much time on Netflix or Amazon Prime? Okay, how many of you actually watch the entire show or how many of you just watch the final episode so you know what to talk about? Is the final show, we do that, we go, like I remember so many shows that I like get like halfway through and I'm like, okay, I'm not really, not really doing this that well. I, I, confession, I didn't watch the entire last three seasons of How I Met Your Mother. Like I just watched the last episode. Um, I tried to watch, I don't know how many times I tried to watch Sons of Anarchy and I just could not do it. But I watched the last episode. I wanted to see what happened. Um, sometimes the last episodes are really frustrating. How many of y'all were Lost fans? Like rabid back in the day. Y'all remember that? Like that, I remember watching, like I, I, I subscribed to it on iTunes and so I paid like the $1.99 an episode and the video iPod had just come out. You remember those and the screen was like this big? And I remember watching Lost on a mission trip holding that iPod like that. Can you want to talk about disappointing last episodes, the last episode of Lost? Like I went back and watched it a few months ago just to get mad again. Like I felt like I needed some anger in my life, so I went and watched that. But, but here's the problem, like when we just do that little, like that last episode trick, like we forget like, like two or three seasons, like we get some finality, like we get some closure, but there's a lot of stuff that we miss, right? Like you're watching it and you're trying to figure out like where your favorite character is and all of a sudden you realize that they've not been there like in three seasons. You don't know what's going on there. There's this new person that's really important and you have no earthly idea who they are. There's that issue. There's, 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 there's story arcs that you miss and you, there's the whole point can't come to you. In this last eight weeks, we've been reading through uh, Jesus's signs in the gospel of John. And we want to talk about story arcs or some, some pretty wild story arcs. We've seen that these signs are, are miracles that Jesus is performing and that uh, he says he performs them to cause belief. But these signs are really different. We've seen him, uh, we've, we've seen him like, like heal people that they're crippled or they're blind. Those are the kind of normal Jesus miracles we expect to see, right? Uh, we see Jesus turn water into wine. Uh, that one's a lot of fun. I'm sure some of us would like to see Jesus do that in our back porch one day. Let's be honest. We've seen Jesus walk on water. That one's pretty wild. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked about how that, but in that story too, like you also see Jesus do like some really weird time travel kind of thing. That's like so crazy. Most commentators just like skip it over. Like we don't want to talk about this. We can't wrap our heads around this. We see multiple story arcs and lines and they're, and they're moving and they're flowing. And today, we're gonna do the last episode, that last sign, that last piece of development of what's going on. But these signs that they've been the visible inbreaking of Jesus's divinity into our humanity. It's been coming, God is being fully in our world. That they ask us to questions like what happens when God's glory gets here? What happens when the presence of God is really with us? we see is that Jesus' presence begins at the edge of what we consider to be possible. And today is the final episode. We've seen Jesus turn water into wine. We've seen Jesus heal people. We've seen Jesus uh, feed 5,000 people with like a road snack. But today Jesus is going to do the final episode when his friend Lazarus is dead. And so let's jump into scripture, John chapter 11. I listened back to the podcast last week when Alan Johnson was talking here. I liked how he referred to the screen as the big Bible. That was kind of fun. So the, the scripture will be on your, uh, your, your, your hand Bible or be on the, the big Bible behind me. But let's read the story from the gospel of John about the final episode in this season. So John 11, uh, we'll start with verse one. We'll read through verse seven. So it says, a man named Lazarus was sick and he lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. 
Now what happened for the glory of God is that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judah were trying to kill you and stone you. Are you going there again? So Jesus is here. He finds out that his friend Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. These are three friends of his that are about to become key players in this story. And they live just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. They had been uh, supporters of his ministry. Uh, the, the, the text kind of tells us some things about them. They were probably wealthy. They're probably pretty influential. But Lazarus was sick. Jesus' friend was sick. Think about that. Jesus had friends. Think about what you would do if you found out your friend was sick. What are the emotions that you would be going through? What would be the things that you'd want to do that you'd feel the need to do? Jesus talks more about his glory, about this, this visible presence. And so much of these signs have been about his glory and what his glory does. And, and there's been times before where people have gotten very, uh, they've tried to get Jesus to do things, to perform signs so they could see cool stuff. We've been referring to this as party tricks. Like they've been treating Jesus like he can, hey, do something cool real quick. We wanna see you do something neat, make something happen. And then when we do this, we don't really understand the whole purpose of these signs. It's not just to show something off, but God's presence is here. And when God's presence is here, his presence has the ability to change things. They're not party tricks, they're after effects. And Jesus talks about how his glory is gonna be seen in new ways and in big ways in this. 17 through 26, the, the story uh, gets deeper. It says this, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus was, has already been in his grave for four days. Now, Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? So belief. Now, if we think back to this story that we've been seeing unfold before us all summer long, Let's think about the key things that show up. And we know, I mean, we've all power watch shows. We've all binged on Netflix. We've all, we realize those, sh those shows we watch and there's those things that we're trying to figure out that are coming alongside. Like if you were a Lost fan, that smoke monster, what was on earth was the smoke monster? Or if you watched How I Met Your Mother, it was the stupid red cowboy boots or the umbrella. If you're a Sons of Anarchy fan, it's whenever you saw the, the young homeless woman pushing the cart, you knew wild things were about to happen. Like we've seen these shows for it and we realize there's these little hints of stories and these bits and pieces that come along that we start paying attention to. And this idea of belief has been one of these things in this story of Jesus' signs all along. He's been talking about glory. And he's been talking about belief. And now he's having a conversation with Martha about belief. He's trying to say, you have seen this world in front of you. Do you believe in this new world? Do you believe in me? Do you believe in the new reality that I've been talking about? Do you believe in the fact that I've been pointing to something that's much bigger than us? Do you believe in this? John 20, 30 and 31, Jesus uh, John kind of wraps up the whole reason that he wrote the book. And, and this is what he said. He said, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. It's this belief is part of the bigger picture. It's not just being a witness to things but believing in the power of what Jesus is doing. We also have this whole thing about Lazarus. He said he's been dead for, for four days. That number means something. 
dead for four days. That's, that's dead quite a long while, wouldn't you say so? If you were here back in March when we did our series on Jonah, I showed you this image I called the hamburger of chaos. Do y'all remember this? Kind of try to explain to you the way that people in the ancient Near East used to think the world ran, like the top hamburger bun is heaven. And then the patty and all the fixings are, are earth. And then the bottom bun is the underworld, the place of the dead. We talked about how Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. That in the ancient Near East, they believed that it took three days for the soul to fully leave a person's body. That after three days, someone was dead. Jesus spent three days in the tomb. We can't look at the prefiguring that's happening there. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Like he's dead, dead. If you're a fan of Jerry Clower, you would call this graveyard dead. <laughs> or if you're a fan of Monty Python, you think that classic, I'm not dead yet, bring out your dead. I feel happy. You've seen it before. Quick aside, if you've ever heard me call my wife Meredith Marimal, it's because on our second date, she fell asleep watching that movie at seven o'clock mo- at night. <laughs> but I'm not dead yet. See, this is not the case. Lazarus is dead. He is gone. He is stinking already. And Jesus comes. The final act of the story, John 11, verse 37 through 44. Or 30, 32 through 34. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger swelled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have helped kept Lazarus from dying? And Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I say it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. There's so much going on in the final part of this story. We see a couple of times it's mentioned that Jesus is angry. You think, like, why, why is Jesus angry? What's making Jesus mad right now? Now we see that people are kind of going back and forth. Like he could have fixed this problem. I imagine Mary said Mary was inside the house when he was talking to Martha. Like Mary's like, I don't even want to see you right now. Like there's a lot of emotion piled up in that, but... I don't think that's what Jesus is angry about. What I think is going on here is a deep beauty because we see two things contrast. We see Jesus' anger at this situation. We also see in verse 35, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. It says, and Jesus wept. See, Jesus is angry because Lazarus is dead and he's angry that Lazarus is dead, not because Lazarus got sick or something happened. Jesus is angry because Lazarus had to die, that death was something that was part of his story. See, death only entered into, into this world when sin entered into this world. We were not designed to die. That's not the way we were made. But because of sin, we can die. Because of sin, Jesus' friend Lazarus died. Not because he did something bad and God punished him, but just the fact that the only two things that we know of that we're sure in this life is death and taxes. Jesus talked about taxes, had given to Caesar what is Caesar's. But Lazarus died. Jesus is mad at this whole economy of sin, this world that is broken. 
that causes this sort of thing to happen. So he's sitting there, like scripture, if we get into the original language, he says that he is quaking. Have you ever been so mad that you're like, you're physically shaking? Like I saw a guy one time that had like a, a pulse and a vein in his forehead. And I feel really bad because I was the one who made that vein pulse a couple of times. Jesus quaking, angry at sin. And at the same time, he's weeping because his friend had died. So Jesus, in the, the fullest expression of who he is, fully God and fully man, we see him in the total power of the divine, quaking at the anger that sin kills us, that sin stops us from our original intention, from the way that he made life to be, in his full divinity, then his full humanity, he's sitting there crying because his friend died. And there's a couple different words for crying in the New Testament. And this is like the sloppy cry word. This is not like the single tear. This is the like snot bubble crying. So just imagine that. Close your eyes. Don't fall asleep if you're not there yet. But just, just imagine this situation. Jesus, the son of God, fully God, fully man, who's been wandering around the countryside for three years, healing and causing amazing things to happen, performing exorcisms, uh, 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 healing crippled people and blind folks and, and multiplying food and walking on water and doing weird time travel stuff. Is equally angry and sad at the same time time this just the fullest expression of humanity we've seen that inside of this this expression of humanity he's he's quaking and he's crying and he's standing there and I imagine he's right there just with tears in front of the stone and he hollers and I imagine it's not hollering because he feels like they need to hear him Imagining, imagine he's hollering because of the, the, the wealth of, a, of emotion that is stored up inside of him right now. And he, he just hollers out, Lazarus, come out. That Jesus' presence begins at the edge of what we would consider to be impossible. The people were there blaming Jesus, saying, you could have fixed this a few days ago, man. When all the while, Jesus had something much bigger planned. But Jesus, fully God, fully man, crying out to his friend. So what can we learn from this? What do we learn from this sign, but also from all of these signs that we've been talking about? And this is the thing I think that this, this Sunday for us to, to, to ponder on is this, that for far too long, we've looked at Jesus simply as being a heaven solution. Like when we're in second grade, third grade, vacation Bible school, like singing the songs, that's an easy thing for us to comprehend. But when we become mature, when we start growing in our discipleship, we realize that this is not just about a heaven solution. That we realize these signs are causing amazing things to happen, not just for, some, for Jesus to do something cool, but we see what happens when God's presence is fully there that is freedom from death, what affected Lazarus and what Jesus has promised to affect us is freedom from death. Is this a benefit or an after effect? It's something much more than a benefit. We think about what the signs have taught us. We've known all along that Jesus gets very frustrated when people ask him to be pragmatic and to perform these signs just so they can see something cool. Jesus gets very frustrated when they pretty much start asking him to do party tricks. What does this mean for us? I'll tell you what I think this means for us. That party tricks are for posers. Think about that. Most, that was the biggest insult when I was in high school. You call somebody a poser, it's going to be a brawl. Party tricks are for posers. Party tricks are for the people who really don't understand who Jesus is. They just want, to, they want Jesus to think they're into him. They want Jesus to think, think they're following him. But in reality, they don't want to try to handle what happens when God's presence shows up. Because it's going to do things that are unimaginable, that are larger than life, that we cannot begin to think and to dream about. And stuff changes, not because God wants to, tries to change them to make us see something, but stuff begins to change because God's presence is there. And when God's presence is there, it's going to affect things in a radically different way and method. 
that when the presence of God comes, life is markedly different. So let's put ourselves in the story to finish things out. What character would we be in this story? I mean, Martha. Would we be Mary? Would we be the crowd that seems to, it's like they're probably paid mourners? I think there's only one person we can really think about ourselves in this story. There's one person that we need to think about ourselves first is that we are each Lazarus. That I'm Lazarus, that, that you are Lazarus. And that for every single one of us, Jesus is, is calling outside of that tomb and asking us to come out. He's calling your name and calling you out. He's, he's at the same time quaking with the anger of sin, the fact that sin can kill you and destroy you, and at the same time weeping because he loves you dearly and he wants to see you live into the fullest expression of life possible. What grave have we put ourselves in that Jesus is standing outside of calling us? Where are we dead? Where am I? I've been asking myself that question all week long. Where am I dead? Man, that'll get to you quick. Where, where have I willfully allowed sin to kill me? Where have we allowed this thing that's deadly to us to be in our life, to rule us? Where is Jesus standing outside of that grave that we put ourselves in? And he's calling our name deeply. That seems a little harsh. That's kind of a gut punch. But if we're going to read this story and and read these signs of Jesus and read about and think about what he wants for us and how he's called us, we've got to have that thought. But death is caused by sin. We have to get to the point. And we live in a, a world that is affected completely by sin. That none of us are free from it. Every single one of us has to fight that battle. Every single one of us has things that we will allow to control us. And sometimes we're aware of it and sometimes we're not aware of it. For the last 48 hours, our country has been wrapped up in a viewing of sin. Of what happens when when we allow hate to control us. When we allow divisiveness to control us, to forget about what the kingdom of God calls and says. To forget about what John, the same writer here, prophesies in Revelation, that every nation, tribe, and tongue will bow together before the Lamb. What happens when we realize all that hate's gonna burn us up? Every one of us has a grave that we're standing inside of, but every one of us also knows that we have a God standing on the other side of that grave who deeply loves us, and that's his first and foremost action directed at us. And any anger he has is not directed at us, but it's directed at the system that calls us to die. He's calling out to us. Whatever it is, Jesus is right there. And whatever places of shame or fear or guilt or embarrassment, whatever we have, Jesus is standing there asking us to come out to give us that full power. He wants to call us out of death and into life. He wants to, he calls our name and is saying, let me work a miracle inside of you. Let me, let me display the presence of God in your life in such a way that everything radically changes around you. And Jesus says, let me bring you back from the dead in many different ways. Jesus does not leave this story undone. He finishes this story. And he finishes it in a way that matters to each and every one of us in a deeply individual way. Where he brings us in as adopted sons and daughters of the king, of the creator of this universe, of the one who loves the best, loves the most, and loved us first. First. 